and welcome to the Ideal Nutrition Podcast. I'm Leah Heigl and I'm here with my co-host Aiden Muir and today we will be talking about apple cider vinegar and its effects on different health outcomes. So topics we will be touching on include weight loss, blood glucose management, cancer, digestion, as well as some potential side effects of taking apple cider vinegar itself. So starting with weight, because this is something I do see a lot of people saying that apple cider vinegar can help with, but I think the first step when it comes to understanding whether something even has potential to help with weight loss is understanding the principles involved in weight loss to start off with. Calories in, calories out. I know it's like cliche. I know it's like everyone talks about it and stuff like that, but understanding that does help us filter whether something even has merit from a mechanistic perspective. Apple cider vinegar obviously isn't necessarily promoted as something that's going to change our calorie intake. It's usually something that's just added in addition to what people are already doing. And it doesn't have any mechanism that could is proposed to influence calories out. So it's not influencing psycho, like that kind of calories in, calories out. So it doesn't really have merit there. Somebody listening to this might be like, oh, well, maybe it could increase fat oxidation. But once again, we've kind of spoken on previous podcasts how fat oxidation doesn't necessarily translate to fat loss. So looking at it from that perspective, the mechanisms don't necessarily make sense. But when we look at the research, that's also quite underwhelming too. I know I'm starting on a negative note, but like it's kind of <laughs> underwhelming. Like if you type in apple cider vinegar for weight loss into Google and you look at a bunch of different articles, you'll see that when people are talking about it as a tool that could help with weight loss, they're often linking to a 12 week Japanese study that had about 155 participants. It didn't involve apple cider vinegar. It involved vinegar, which is basically what is promoted to be the thing that is going to be helping with all of these things. But the apple part of it is usually just for flavor. So it was a study on vinegar and this resulted in a weight loss of 1.7 kilos over 12 weeks. So you could listen to that and be like, oh, maybe it does help a little bit. Like that's that's not crazy, but it's also something that could be helping. But it's obviously a bit more nuanced than that. First, for context, participants consumed about 500 ml of liquid, ranging from zero to 30 ml of vinegar inside that liquid per day, based on whichever group they'll put in. But in general, they lost that 1.7 kilos. Intake was self-reported, which is obviously, I don't want to say a red flag, but it's obviously a variable we need to consider. Um, Within four weeks post-trial, on average, people had regained 1.4 kilos. So once again, that's worth mentioning as well. And I say this not as a joke, but as a legitimate way of looking at this. Nausea is a common symptom from apple cider vinegar. If we ever see these small losses, because although I've, I've mentioned one study, there's a lot of studies that are showing around one kilo weight loss over 12 weeks or anything like that. Is nausea explaining that? It's just it's slightly reducing calorie intake because yeah. you're feeling nauseous. Yeah. Uh, the next aspect we will look at is from a slightly more positive note, which is always great. Yeah. Um, and that's looking at blood glucose level management. So apple cider vinegar actually does seem pretty promising for reducing blood glucose levels. And the mechanism here is that the acetic acid in the apple cider vinegar helps with delaying gastric emptying. So Although this mechanism requires that apple cider vinegar needs to be consumed nearer to meal times, it actually could be something that is somewhat um, of relevance to people with diabetes or um, just insulin resistance itself and where you are struggling to manage your blood glucose levels. Having apple cider vinegar around meal times could actually be a small win. Uh, one example is seen in a study where they gave participants vinegar prior to the consumption of 50 grams of white bread and blood glucose levels were raised 31% less um, when the vinegar was taken around the time of the carbohydrate intake. So like I said, not particularly relevant for like the population as a whole, but somewhat relevant for people that struggle with blood glucose management. Yeah, that's easily the most clear cut one. That's a very common finding in the research that we find that consistently it reduces any raises in blood glucose levels post eating. So if there's anything you see somebody talking about apple cider vinegar for, and they do mention that, that's actually something that we do consistently see in the research. Cholesterol is a bit more complex. I recall when I'd previously written about apple cider vinegar many years ago, I'd kind of just kind of brush it off being like, oh, I don't really think it helps with cholesterol. I've kind of 
softened my stance a little bit being like maybe there's a bit of potential um animal studies look promising but <laughs> spoken about this heaps that's not necessarily <laughs> overly relevant for humans i'd much rather see the research on humans and we are fortunate that there have been at least nine relevant studies on this topic that a systematic review has looked at and it concluded that it could help cholesterol but it is more nuanced than that so the impact on cholesterol like total cholesterol is tiny so the wording that that systematic review used was that this significantly decreased total cholesterol and unfortunately the units that they used it was like in, it was American units, so I'm not overly familiar with it. I did the conversion just through Google, etc. And like the absolute change that came out was 0.16 millimole per liter, unless I've made a mistake, right? And adding context around that, so 0.16 millimole per liter. The goal of what we'd call like primary prevention with cholesterol is keeping it below four millimole per liter. Secondary prevention, depending on what people are looking at, is either. 5.5 millimole per liter or six. And usually once people are above say seven millimole per liter, doctors start kind of talking about statins and being like, should we introduce statins or let's try and let's try and solve this with diet first and then maybe we'll revisit statins down the line. So when you look at like four, 5.5, six, mm -hmm. seven, those type of numbers, 0 0.16 isn't- It's like a drop in the ocean really. Yeah. Like is it statistically significant when you have a large sample size? Probably, but is it- practically relevant i'm not really sure well i, I would say not <laughs> <laughs> yeah not particularly helpful but a little bit more yeah nuanced than maybe yeah. if initially anticipated yeah um so the next topic we will touch on is cancer so some people do talk about utilizing apple cider vinegar for reducing just general cancer risk um but going back to being i guess slightly negative there's there's no direct convincing evidence indicating that apple cider vinegar does reduce cancer risk the claim itself mostly stems from the concepts related to the alkaline diet um which is a whole wormhole in itself i think we have yeah, covered we've that before that, yeah. um and uh, so looking at a systematic review on the alkaline diet um, and looking at the research around that is once again no evidence to suggest that that diet itself reduces cancer risk either um so overall at this point in time i would definitely not be backing the claim that apple cider vinegar reduces cancer risk in any way. Yeah, so there's no direct research on it, on vinegar and cancer to the best of my knowledge, yeah. but the mechanism doesn't really make sense. Even like I think we talked about on that podcast where uh, there's people claiming that like cancer cells can't even grow in an alkaline environment. We've kind of spoken about how much we can shift pH to the body anyway. We can't make massive shifts, but like I do believe there was one like petri dish study where they like they created an alkaline envi environment and cancer cells still grew. <laughs> like it wasn't like oh even in a petri yeah, it's dish not like study. It's like yeah, like, <laughs> um, I don't know. Like for what it's worth, though, like saying the stuff that we can say with absolute confidence. Like there's no research on vinegar specifically with cancer. With so, cancer risk, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't get too far ahead on that one. <clears throat> in terms of digestion, digestion is a tough one because when somebody says their digestion is improved how are we specifically measuring that? Like, don't take that too literally in terms of like, somebody could say that their, their digestion has improved and that, that's definitely a thing. But the reason why I'm using this kind of concept of like, how are we measuring it is when we're looking at research and we're like, we're looking at measuring specific outcomes, are we looking at things like reductions in IBS type symptoms in terms of like bloating and diarrhea or constipation or whatever? Are we looking at like, digestion improving in terms of things just moving quicker and stuff like that people are digesting food more quickly more efficiently all of those kind of things um with vinegar or apple cider vinegar specifically there's no research on this topic to the best of my knowledge in terms of measuring any of those symptoms or digestion specifically but there are some proposed mechanisms one mechanism is delayed gastric emptying but that could be interpreted from the other angle as well in terms of like theoretically that is slowing digestion like if you slowed digestion, but it improved it in terms of like <laughs> digesting your food better. Like it, it, you could, you could interpret that from both ways in terms of like slower digestion could be better or worse depending on how you look at it. Um, the other mechanism that is specific to apple cider vinegar. So this is the outlier. All the other stuff is mostly based on the acetic acid, um, but specific to apple cider vinegar and not just vinegar is that there's a thing in apple cider vinegar called the mother, which is basically the cloud of bacteria at the bottom of apple cider vinegar. This could have a potential beneficial probiotic effect. 
at this stage, there's obviously anecdotal outcomes. There's, there's a lot of people who've said, I've done this, I feel better. And without any research, we can't really say anything. Like we, yeah. can, we can say that like there's potential mechanisms with the dis- delayed gastric emptying and that probiotic thing. And that's all I've really got to add on that topic. Yeah, it's, um, it's a little bit of a, a complicated mixed bag. Um, but I definitely have had clients take apple cider vinegar and be like, my digestion is so much better. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, th- cool. That's great for you. Whether or not I like, I mean, I wouldn't go out of my way to recommend it though. And I think you stand in the same, yeah. And we'll talk through that too. Same yeah. ballpark. Yeah. Um, okay. So going on to the potential side effects or I guess caution warnings when it comes to apple cider vinegar, um, I want to talk around kind of tooth enamel and, and other, uh, things in that vein. Um, so apple cider vinegar is acidic to the point that it can negatively impact your tooth enamel, if not diluted. Um, this is so clear cut that it would actually be unethical to study in humans as part of an RCT or a randomized control trial. Um, but in vitro studies have demonstrated this effect quite clearly. So we do know that apple cider vinegar is acidic enough to definitely negatively impact your the health of your teeth. Um, the easy way to avoid this obviously would to be to somewhat dilute the apple cider vinegar um, instead of having it straight um, or at a minimum, at least rinsing your mouth afterwards. So you don't have this like acidic residue on your teeth for a long period of time. So that's, I guess, just a little caution warning if this is something you are going to try. Um, and then I also want to talk about what you've labeled esophagus stuff in our notes. <laughs> um, but let's talk through, I guess, impacts on the, the health of your esophagus. So there is no clear evidence that apple cider vinegar does have a negative impact on the esophagus, but we also always want to be kind of erring on the side of caution. Um, and here I'd like to note that the ingestion of vinegar is a common cause of throat burn in children. So even though we don't have like this clear cut evidence to be like, yeah, apple cider vinegar is going to cause some burns in the esophagus. I think we can assume that there may be some damage in some people if you were to take that undiluted and consistently. Um, there is also a case report of a, women, a woman who had apple cider vinegar, an apple cider vinegar tablet stuck in her throat and was suffering from burns as much as six months later. So there is definitely, I guess, some area for caution when it comes to this. Yeah, at minimum, it definitely makes sense to at least dilute it if you're going down this route. Totally. So now we'll talk about like how or if we would use it would you do you ever recommend apple cider vinegar? I have never recommended apple cider vinegar for any of these purposes. <laughs> yeah, it, it leads to a kind of interesting point because I actually am in the same boat as you, unless yeah. somebody specifically asks. Because if you go back to that like blood glucose thing, we can kind of talk about this for a second. But like the blood glucose thing, if we see these reductions in blood glucose levels, why are neither of us recommending it mm. often? I, I mean, for me, it doesn't apply to most of my clients who don't have an issue with managing blood glucose levels. Mm-hmm. But even still, when I'm working with a diabetic client or someone with insulin resistance, I just think there is so much other stuff that we can do that has a better outcome than this. Although I do see it as potentially an easy win. And if someone brings it up um, for the management of blood glucose levels, like I'm happy to talk through it, but obviously I'll give those caveats of please dilute it. Um, and, and just do a stop, stop this negative side effects. Yeah. That's pretty much exactly where I'm at too. Like if somebody with type two diabetes is, is wanting to go down that route, I'm on board. I'm like, I see heaps of benefits for it, yeah. but I, I also don't go out of my way. And like, you could say like, there's not really a great reason why I don't go out of my way to do it just beyond the fact that there's so many other recommendations that I'm making that I do think have more impact. And it's like, if I have a priority list, this is lower on the list of priorities. And it's like, if I have a lot of sessions with somebody, it might be something that I bring up in a far later session, just because there's things I think will have more of an impact, but that doesn't mean it may or may not have its place. Like if somebody's interested in it, I'm on board because it's like, at least it's another thing we can, we could be doing that could help improve the management that there's buy-in to as well. 
Yeah. Although I think to a certain degree, I think something like this, like apple cider vinegar, me recommending it, I feel like it somewhat reduces my credibility as a health professional because it just does seem like a bit of an off the wall thing bit, yeah. to recommend, yeah. um, even though we do see these kinds of positive outcomes in that case. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty fine of doing it for like, there's a lot of things I do that I'm like, I'm pretty confident this will help. Yeah. Like, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter how I, it's perceived or whatever, but yeah, like I can see the logic. This has been episode 108 of the Ideal Nutrition Podcast. If you haven't yet left a rating or review, that would be greatly appreciated. But otherwise, thanks for tuning in.